All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Beyond Access series. Uh, my name is Jose Rios Lua. I am the Director of Family Empowerment and Communications for the Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support, and I'll be your host this evening. Uh, we're very excited to be joined by the Cerebral Palsy Foundation to kick off our Disability Awareness Month for the Beyond Access series. Now, before we get started with the presentation, I have just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, as always, this session will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page the following day. So look out for an email from us tomorrow with that link. What this means is don't worry if you miss a couple of things here or there, you'll be able to go back and listen to the entire thing once it's posted. Um, if you don't follow us on our YouTube channel, uh, what are you doing? Uh, you, follow us, please. Uh, make sure you subscribe so that you get notified whenever we upload new videos. Um, there's all, I also just wanna remind everybody that tonight there's no chat function during the session, but the Q&A function is available for all of you to ask your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, our presenters uh, and myself and Ori will be in the background answering questions throughout the presentation. Um, but we also have some dedicated time reserved towards the end to answer some questions live. Uh, now, we're very excited to kick off part one of this award-winning four-part series. Um, we're really excited that Cerebral Palsy Foundation has adapted their Just Say Hi content just for you all. I won't say too much about it because I'll let, I'll let them uh, do all the great talking, but tonight we're talking about what is disability and introducing disability. And the goal for tonight is to open up the topic of what disability is and explore disability history and family relevant laws that will leave you with actionable ways to advocate for disability inclusion in your child's school. Before I hand it over to the CPF group, I just wanna give a special shout out tonight. Thanks to the thanks to the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, we have ASL interpretation. So I just wanna shout out to Greeny um, for being our ASL interpreter tonight uh, and really just say thank you. If, you. if you joined early enough, you saw her amazing interpretation skills with music. And I know she's gonna do a great job with the rest of the presentation. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ashley and Rachel who will be tonight's presenters. Thank you so much, Jose. And we are thrilled obviously to be here tonight and to be delivering the first of actually a, a four part webinar series. So as Jose mentioned, we're tonight gonna to be discussing an introduction to disability and, and history and laws. And before I start uh, for accessibility, um, I am a white woman with brown hair that is uh, tied back wearing a, a black shawl and actually sitting in my lounge room here in New York City. Um, we are also intentionally varying our language usage um, between first person language and identity first language during this presentation. And that is to respect the differencing, different pre preferences of the disability community. Um, I'll hand it over to Ashley to introduce herself. Hi y'all, it's so great to be here with you this evening. Uh, my name is Ashley harris Whaley, and I lead engagement and communities at the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Relevant to know that I also have cerebral palsy, so that perspective um, comes through in all the work that I do. I'm a white woman with long curly brown hair. I'm wearing a green turtleneck and I'm in my office here in North Carolina and uh, behind me is both a door and a bookshelf. So we're so excited to kick things off and get started. So before we dive in deep to what disability is, we thought it would be super helpful to talk about some things that disability isn't. A lot of folks have preconceived ideas about what disability looks like, and this is largely thanks to exposure to inaccurate disability representation. A prime example of this is villains in the James Bond franchise. Almost all villains in all the Bond movies, and there's like a ton of them, Almost all of them have some kind of facial disfigurement or a physical disfigurement or disability. And this really leads to the reinforcement of negative stereotypes. A few other pretty common um, disability tropes are disability as a tragedy or that disabled people suffer 
or that disability is some kind of superpower. Um, one of my favorite, and by favorite, I mean least favorite, disability tropes is the conversation around disability being solely inspirational. And that's what we have to, th to thank for, you know, things like this aphorism on the bottom here, like the only disability in life is a bad attitude. It's just very inaccurate. Um, can disabled people be inspirational? Of course, all kinds of disabled people do truly inspirational things on the daily. We're gonna introduce you to a couple of them, but are disabled people inspirational for just living our everyday lives? Not hardly. And then the last um, disability trope that we kind of want to upend is the notion of a disability as something to overcome. FDR is probably our um, most textbook illustration of this kind of framework of disability as, as overcoming. But in reality, you know, you can't overcome something that's a part of you. Most disabled people don't view their disabilities that way. We view them as um, either an extension of ourselves or an element of our identity. And you can't really overcome something like that, you know? So now that we've shown you sort of what disability isn't, we've got that part out of the way, we'd really like to reframe our perception around disability and in part use this phenomenal quote from Neil Marcus and it's, it's one of our favourites. So disability is not a brave struggle or courage in the face of adversity. Disability is an art, is an ingenious way to live. And I think when you start seeing the examples that we're about to present you with, it really starts to you know, form the picture of not only how can we start talking about disability, um, but how do we start thinking about disability and how can we sort of grow as a community? So the disability community is also the largest minority group, both in the US and around the world. And it's really the only marginalized identity that intersects across all other identities. So within the disability community, there is so much diversity, which is so wonderful. Um, and it includes all different types of disabilities. So disabilities can be temporary or permanent. They can be visible or invisible. They can be genital and or acquired. And, you know, it should be noted that actually in New York City public schools, um, there is over 100,000 students uh, with disabilities. And actually in US public schools, there's more than 7 million students. And so, you know, it's a really big part of the school community. And these students really need to be included and to feel like they have a place to belong. So I'm super excited, actually Rachel is super excited um, to introduce you guys to some folks that are in the disability community so that you get a taste of what accurate um, representation looks like. And these are my peers and I'm just, you know, thrilled to have the opportunity for us to share them with you. Yeah, so as Ashley said, you know, accurate representation is so important and it's something that we really haven't seen within pop culture and, you know, really before probably the last two years, if you turned your TV screen on, you didn't see people with disabilities on screen. You know, one of the biggest things that we always heard was if you want to win an Oscar, play a person with a disability, right? And it wasn't actually true representation. And so I think, you know, being able to elevate, um, the people that we're about to introduce you to as role models, as exceptional leaders in their fields. You know, these are really people that have excelled um, both, you know, with what they have actually trained to do, but also they're really in elevating the voice of the disability community. So I've had the really fortunate experience of actually meeting um, Haben Germer and listening to her speak. And uh, she is a, a deaf blind woman. And this is a really, you know, Quote that I love from her is disability is not something an individual overcomes. I'm still disabled. I'm still deaf blind. People with disabilities are successful when we develop alternative techniques and our communities choose inclusion. And I think this is really important. And what we're really sort of discussing today is how as a community can we choose inclusion? And you know, as I said, I've, I've had the fortunate experience of, of watching her present and speak in a, in a room. And when we're thinking about the communication challenges that you might think about, you know, for a deafblind woman and how she communicates through uh, braille and, and question time, it makes us all go, okay, what are we comfortable with in our communication? How can we expand what we're used to? You know, it's wonderful having Greenie here this evening. 
to go, okay, you know, what can we provide as a community so that everyone can be included? We're gonna play a video clip for y'all for just a second. Bear with me with getting it to play. Sometimes you have to click multiple times. Here we go. I'm actually hearing it from her own words. Exactly. Oh. My name is Havan Gurma. I'm a black woman. I'm also disabled. So I experience both. Guys, we're gonna try again. That wasn't supposed to happen. I have to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> but we will give it our best shot to try again. Nothing like technical issues, am I right? Mm. There's always at least one. Always, like without fail, every single time. <laughs> yeah, we promise you it's worth it because, yeah, yeah as for I said, sure. you know, one thing that we find is really important is thinking about representation and making sure that everybody's voice is elevated in this conversation. Let's give it another go. Racism and ableism in a society that struggles with those two. Disability is an opportunity for innovation. If you face a challenge, that's an opportunity to come up with a brand new solution. And that solution could end up helping not only you, but the entire community. The disability community is full of these examples. Yes, there's a challenge. The challenge is to come up with new ways to connect with people, to access information. This is a challenge both for the disabled person and for the entire community, because ultimately it's the community's responsibility to remove the barriers so everyone can be included. We need everyone to be working on inclusion for the entire community. Women, people of color, disabled people, it benefits all of us. It behooves all of us to remove the barriers. And we just love her message, obviously, thinking about, you know, as a community, what action can we take? And this is where I think we can really sort of evolve thinking about school communities and everybody's responsibilities. And we're going to talk about allyship in a little bit. But one another person that I really want to introduce you to is... Tiffany Hammond and Tiffany Hammond is an autistic writer, speaker and educator and she's also the parent of two autistic sons as well and she provides a wealth of resources and perspectives in the online education space and I think one thing that's really interesting to sort of see is from her perspective this complex relationship between parents and students and teachers and how do we be good allies at the same time as also being a parent, being an advocate and doing all these different things in the school. And, and this is a quote that I love from her. I know how challenging it can be to raise a child who cannot communicate in a way that is not most convenient for you. And I think this is a really thing to challenge all of us to think, all right, what, how are we comfortable communicating? Are we comfortable communicating, obviously using our voices? Are we comfortable communicating texting somebody? Are we comfortable communicating with ASL? And I think this is the piece where if we really sort of need to expand how we're thinking communication looks and being open to what works for others may not actually feel that comfortable or work for us, but just knowing that, okay, this is how they need to do things and really being open and, um, you know, trying to create that within our school communities. The next person we want to introduce to you is one of my personal favorite people of all time. He is an author and a YouTuber. He and his wife, Hannah, have um, a successful YouTube channel called Squirmy and Grubs, and this is Shane Burkhoff. We often hear a lot of negative stereotyping and stigma surrounding mobility equipment, right, and wheelchairs. Um, but the reality is wheelchairs don't cause inaccessibility and they don't limit people. They actually open up the world for folks. So I'm going to play this video and let's cross our fingers that we do it without any kind of event. Uh -huh. 
of that video kind of flew through there a little bit fast. So Shane's messaging was that yes, doctors did tell his parents that he would never walk. And that turned out to be the truth. And that hasn't impacted the fullness of his life in any way. It's still turned out to be amazing. So now that we've introduced you to some fabulous members of the disability community, we need to take a look at sort of the scope of disability rights in the 20th century. Um, we're going to go all the way from institutionalizations beginnings in the 1930s through the 1960s to the beginnings of the civil rights movement. Uh, the disability civil rights movement specifically. And then we're gonna end up in the 1990s with the Capitol crawl and the passage of the ADA. It's, you know, it's impossible to understand how the disability community now has gotten to the point where we are without understanding and showing you where it is that we came from. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. So in the 1930s, so let's go back, you know, almost 100 years now, institutionalization was really the default. So when we think about that, it really resulted in pretty appalling conditions for people with disabilities. And while we hope that that is obviously past tense, I think we still just need to acknowledge that actually in some parts of the world, that is actually still the current environment. And to a certain extent, in some of the pieces that we still see today, there is this sort of historical piece of where institutionalization is, is still being seen. Um, and that can sort of be seen in, in lots of different ways. So obviously, if we sort of then move through thinking about the, the 1940s and the 1950s, you know, the continuation of the stigma surrounding disabilities really ensured that people were not welcome to participate in society. And they were really precluded from things like employment, education, transportation, and participation in politics and, and, and community access and engagement. And the thing is, why are all these important things for us to understand? It's because the continuation of this stigma actually is still here today. And I think, you know, understanding where it's come from, understanding sort of where this all started is really important if we're going to think about, well, how, what are our solutions? What are our, you know, how do we problem solve to actually make the here and now a lot better than what it was? So I think obviously, you know, the, the disability civil rights movement um, is definitely not past tense. So while it started in the 1960s, um, it is still very much going on today. And, and you, we're going to actually introduce you to some really incredible people who not only started this movement, but are still leading the movement. Um, and the wonderful thing when we think about the disability rights movement, it really started and came together because of community. And it was a group of um, people with disabilities who came together alongside their allies to make real change. And when we think about the momentum and how that cultivated, it was really sort of the friendships that happened. And so if we look at sort of in the 1960s and 70s, you've got people like Ed Roberts and other activists who actually started uh, with the first uh, physically disabled students program at UC Berkeley. And why this is so important, again, is because it's that collective student body that was saying, all right, we're gonna stand up and make change. The other places where this sort of really happened as well is, is places like summer, in the summer camps. And when we think about what those summer camps look like, and I hope most of you have seen Crip Camp, and if you haven't, you should. It's an Oscar-nominated uh, documentary that was out in 2020, and it really provides a whole look, actually, on disability history and particularly the influence that these camp programs had. But I think more importantly, well, why were camps needed? And it was because... It, the, the other summer camps were really exclusionary. And so, you know, the, I suppose the, the positive of that 
is it created a collective, it created a sense of community within the disability community and they were then able to make change. But, you know, really it came uh, formed out of exclusion. And when we think about the, the who, um, you've got incredible people like uh, Judith Human and Jim Labrack. And I'm going to hand it over to Ashley who can talk about this a little bit more. Yeah, I'm excited to introduce y'all to the 504 sit-in, which if you didn't know, you might already occurred in the late 1970s. Um, notable for a lot of reasons. Um, of course, one of them being that it was the longest federal sit-in uh, to date that's ever occurred. And also that it was organized, carried out, driven almost entirely by disabled people themselves. And I have lived my whole life uh, as a disabled person. And believe it or not, the first time I ever really learned about sort of modern disability history and the disability civil rights movement was when I was in college. And I don't know about y'all, but that seems awfully late to me. You know, learning about that history for the first time, really my history, right? was a pretty transformative experience and it impacted the trajectory of my life and certainly the trajectory of my career. And, you know, the thing is, is we want disabled kids um, to understand their history and we want them to have those connections. And what's cool about the 504 sit-in specifically is that it ended up being a driver for um, legislation that prohibits discrimination that's based on disability in any kind of program that receives federal funding. So 504 plans, which we're gonna come back to later, those are still very much used in school environments today. And this is what they came out of. Like they're a direct result of this action. And it's important for both kids with disabilities and parents to understand this historical context and understand what brought about these civil rights. We talked about, you know, earlier how the prevailing attitudes in the first half of the 20th century were really that not only were disabled people excluded from pretty much every single facet of society, but beyond that, they were not expected to participate in society. Like the expectation wasn't even there. And I think that this quote by Judith Human, whom I'm excited to talk a little bit more about in the next few minutes, it really underscores how this was kind of the tipping point, right? This is when those expectations or the lack of the expectation really began to change. And Judy has played such a huge role for not only me as like a personal role model, but I think probably pretty much every other living disabled person. She's pretty phenomenal. And so I want to introduce you all to some of the activists who were directly responsible for the disability civil rights that we have now. We'll start with Judy. This is her here talking at the microphone. And she is known as the mother of the disability rights movement. And boy, has she earned that title. She um, started her career uh, in disability activism, probably at Camp Jeanette. And then she also actually fought the New York Department of Education when she was a teacher in New York City schools and she actually won her case. She was a prominent leader and a co-organizer of the 504 sit-in. She's still very active um, in activism today. She has a memoir out that you can read. She's featured in Crip Camp and she also has a pretty fabulous um, podcast. So we'll talk about some of these other folks um, who unfortunately like are no longer with us, but they were absolutely crucial to the success of this movement. Up in the top right corner is Brad Lomax, and he was a disabled member of the Black Panther Party. And I don't know if y'all are aware of this, 
but the Black Panthers were directly responsible for the success of the 504 sit-in because they showed up as true allies in that time and provided food and support to the disabled activists. It probably would not have happened without them. Here in the center on the right is Ed Roberts. We've touched on him a bit already. He is known as the father of the independent living movement. And he really helped forge a path that allowed disabled people access to the supports that they need to live independently. And in the bottom right corner is Kitty Cohn. She was also a very prominent um, disability rights activist of the time and was actually the leader and organizer of the 504 sit-in itself. So I think as you can hopefully probably see that the disability community themselves is a source of knowledge and absolutely an incredible resource for education. And really, you know, I think there's hopefully been a shift in actually in, in how we perceive who are the experts in disability. Well, those with lived experience are. And so as parents, as educators, obviously going to those with lived experience and understanding the different elements is just as important as going to a physician or a doctor or a teacher you know, really utilize that. That's, that's one of the biggest things that I can encourage any parent who's listening is to actually look for role models within the disability community. And that's just not for yourself, for your knowledge, but that's for your children as well. So we're paying an awful lot of attention to disability history right now. And we got to ask ourselves, like, why is this all so important? You know, it's not just about the fact that disability history is not taught in schools. It's also about providing kids with disabilities a connection to their history and also about providing y'all as their parents with a greater understanding of all of this that may or may not be new to you and a connection to something that's bigger than you and your child as individuals. It's not about statistics or numbers or labeling people across disabilities. It's to generate accessibility and inclusion. There is, in general, a conversation around labels that carries kind of a negative connotation. But the truth is, is that labels allow us to make change happen. A, lab a label allows us to work within an existing system. You know, how are we making sure that every student is fully included and fully a part of their school community? The label doesn't create the barrier. The lack of access and inclusion creates the barrier. So we're gonna head back to our timeline after that little side detour, and we're gonna bring ourselves to some more recent disability history. So in March of 1990, the disability community decides essentially that they have had enough. <laughs> and so a movement was organized, um, galvanized a whole large group of disabled activists who were of course accompanied by their allies, and they literally, quite literally, crawled up the steps of the Capitol, crawled up the front steps to draw attention to the inaccessibility and the inequality and the segregation that disabled people lived in sort of by default. And this is a photo of Jennifer Keelan Chapins. She, uh, at that time, was an eight-year-old activist who happens to also have cerebral palsy and her presence really helped um, center the media attention around this event. There were was tons of coverage. It was a huge deal. And wouldn't you know it that four months later, their demands were granted and the Americans with Disabilities Act was finally passed. The five um, titles of the ADA are title number one, which prohibits employment discrimination, title number two, which addresses public services, 
Title number three, which concerns public accommodations. Title number four, which addresses telecommunications. And title number five, which sets forth a pro uh, whew, uh, provision that prohibits either coercing or threatening or retaliating against individuals with disabilities or those who are attempting to aid people with disabilities in asserting their rights under the ADA. Also in 1990, this was a big year for disability rights, y'all. The IDEA was passed, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This act had a different title back in the 1970s, but the meat of it is that it required all federally funded public schools to provide disabled students with one free meal per day and access to an equal and free education. Previously, parents of disabled children were expected to pay for private school or pay for tutoring or pay for some kind of day support service. And the IDEA also requires schools to evaluate students and to create individualized education plans that are tailored to meet student needs. It established the concept of least restrictive environment, which is still used today, and also requires that a child's progress be evaluated periodically and their education plans be updated as needed. So with the passage of the ADA in 1990, in March actually, so 30, actually July, the Capitol crawls in March, I'm getting ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. 32 years ago, President George H.W. Bush finally said, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. And while that's a perfectly nice sentiment, and the ADA was certainly a cultural milestone in the fights for disability rights and disability justice, we can absolutely celebrate the impact of the ADA while still acknowledging that there is much more work to be done and still acknowledging that we have to work within the frameworks and the systems that are already in place. So when we're talking about sort of those frameworks and systems, and I'm sure many of you uh, are aware and potentially your children have an IEP, so an individual edu uh, education program. Now, this was obviously a piece of legislation that came in and why it's so important is it's because it is still used today. And so we thought it might be helpful if we sort of break down at the IEP and actually the 504s for you. And for an IEP, students really need to meet two requirements. The first being they need to identify that the student has one or more of the disabilities listed among the 13 disability categories in the IDEA. And they also need to determine whether the student's disabilities require special education services in order to learn to benefit from the, from the general education curriculum and or to make progress. Now, it's really important to understand and to realize if a student doesn't qualify for an IEP, there are other options. And so when we're thinking about those other options, um, a 504 plan is one of them. And so that Ashley told you the history and, and really the monumental moment when 504s really sort of started to, to be in, to become law and obviously, you know, to move forward with what is now what we see as inclusion. But Section 504 covers a broader definition around disability than the IDEA. And by saying that a disability must substantially limit one or more basic life activities, such as learning, reading, communicating, or thinking. The student's disability must interfere with the student's ability to learn in a general education classroom. And a student with a disability may have a 504 plan rather than an IEP, um, depending on what's appropriate for them. And so I think we're gonna now talk about, well, what are the major differences between an uh, IEP and a 504? And when we're thinking about that, um, the basic difference really can sort of be summed up in one sentence. And that is that both plans provide accommodations, but only an IEP provides the specialized instruction for students in grades K to 12, um, while a 504 Four plan concerns students actually both K to 12 and then into college as well. So if we're going to sort of then think about, well, 
what's next and what do I do as a family? How do I know what my child might need? Is it an IEP or a 504? And we really encourage you then to have very open conversations with your school, with the teachers at your school going, okay, this is what my child needs. And really involving your child in the conversation as well, more than anything there is because as Ashley said, these sort of IEPs really should be individualized and modified for each of your children. So two big things to think about when we're talking about the language between IEPs and 504s is the difference between accommodations and modifications. And these are things I think that we all sort of need to think about in the context of the classroom. So if we think about an accommodation, an accommodation changes how a student is taught in order to learn the material. And a modification changes um, a student is taught or expected to learn. So it's, it's going different, sorry, and that should say what. So a modification changes what a student is taught or expected to learn, whereas an accommodation changes how a student is taught. Um, so when we're thinking about those two different things, you know, students will need either one of those or both of those. Um, so it's really important to make sure that there's these open lines of communication, both with yourselves and the school. And with all the history and the context that we've introduced you in mind, you know, how can we ensure this? And I think this is the tricky thing because inclusion can feel daunting, inclusion can feel hard, advocacy can feel hard and, and trying to think, well, how can I be the best ally both to my child as well as then to others within the school environment? And this is where I think as a foundation, we really thought, what can we do about this? You know, obviously, when we think about policy and all these incredible laws that have been done that are still used today, they're amazing. But there's still a few other things when we think about, well, what about attitudinal shift? What about those different things about going, well, friendships and allyship and all those other elements? And this is where we thought of developing the Just Say Hi program that we're going to show you a little snippet of um, uh, some of the components of it. Hang on, guys. Well, this is unexpected. So there's always one technical issue, but apparently we've reached our quota and we're now at two. But what we can do is we can either send this video to y'all so it can be disseminated so you can learn about just say hi or if we have some time at the end we can try a different route. Rachel okay. is this the Ali Pond school? It is Ali Pond. Um, I just wanted to so, jump in as like I've, I've been there and I've seen their just say hi program. Yeah I've, absolutely. Um, it's, it's actually quite amazing how um, Ali Pond was able to leverage uh, just say hi not just in a few classrooms but make it a a campus-wide uh, culture shift. Yeah, so, you know, really, Ali Pond's such a, a phenomenal story. So we started um, Just Say Hi. So when we think about what Just Say Hi is, it really is an inclusion program um, for all students and really can be something that uh, can be put in all schools. And so it's this sort of robust program and, and it started five years ago. So it was a um, collaboration between the New York City Department of Education as well as NYU Langone. And Ali Pond was one of the first um, schools who were a pilot of this program. So we started in five schools, went to eight schools, went to 20 schools, you know, went to almost 100 schools um, before the pandemic. So, you know, I think um, what they actually did, which is sort of a phenomenal thing when we think about implementation, they saw a need in the school. They were seeing potentially an increase in, in bullying and, and some other things that they thought, well, what can we utilize? And they utilized Just Say Hi, and as Jose said, across every single classroom in their school and actually implemented it within a one month period and really were able to start having conversations around you know breaking down stereotypes around the power of language around all these different things understanding disability history because I think it's always so important when we want to find our sense of identity and belonging you know where did we come from what is our history um, so yeah they are an absolutely remarkable school and we love working with them 
So, you know, when we think about the curriculum itself, um, it is a three prong curriculum and it's for all stakeholders because one of the, the things that we learn along this sort of process, as I said, we're, we're now in what our sixth year, um, it's not just obviously students who are part of the um, school community, it really is everybody. So you've got students with and without disabilities, families, of course, so obviously everyone who's listening tonight, um, and then educators and staff as well. And so our big thing to all of you would say, it's time to join the conversation. So if there isn't a disability curriculum that's happening in your school, if these conversations aren't happening in your school, this is a wonderful package um, that you could utilize. And I think when we think about the impact, right? So, so why? And, and we've sort of uh, spoken a little bit about it already today, but you know, law and advocacy and policies, that gets us only so far, but how are we actually gonna really make real change? How are we gonna think about, well, what will this do for the, our students? You know, it's all these small components that build up to making this really sort of wonderful thing. And what we've seen is that research shows um, worldwide that students with disabilities are positive and effective when we look at disability curriculum based programs. Um, we know that attitudes shift. Um, we also know that new skills are acquired and an increase in social emotional learning, which is so important, and obviously people's physical well being. And I think the, the big thing here is that it actually provides an opportunity for genuine allyship and friendships. Because I think when we think about students and, and where we want them to be, when they finish grade 12, it's being that amazing uh, part of a community. You know, where do they belong in that community? You know, what friendships have they gained? And speaking of allyship, now we're gonna give you four ways that you can actually facilitate it um, as parents and as members of the broader school community. So first up is we've talked about this a bit in the beginning, but the process of surrounding yourself with accurate disability representation. We've talked a lot about what disability isn't, right? And a lot about what it is and our understanding of what it is, our true understanding, comes from accurate representation. You know, who is leading the conversations that you're hearing in disability spaces? Is it dis disabled individuals themselves? You know, find your representation through the disability community. Read our books, follow us on social media. We have a lot of podcasts, you know, there are so many resources that are available to you. And a component of that, right, is a little bit of what we've been doing today in learning about disability history. This was a drop in the bucket and sort of beginning that quest of like self-learning for yourself to learn these things and understanding the laws and the rights of students with disabilities um, and understanding that like, yes, advocacy and activism are so important. But in this, you know, in the school setting and outside of school under the ADA, these things are the law. And that is really, you know, what it comes down to is that your students have civil rights that are protected. And educating yourself on like, what is the current scope of the disability rights movement? What's going on right now? What, um, what are things that disabled folks are advocating for and educating on. And it all fits together in just helping you form a greater understanding of the current state of affairs. And um, you get that through representation too, right? And it's just so important for your children and your students with disabilities to like be active members of this community as they get older and what you are doing is priming them for that. And then number four, like Rachel was saying, true and genuine allyship, because we're, we're not interested in the superficial stuff, right? Genuine allyship comes from the cultivation of relationships and friendships. And now, you know, we'd love your involvement and your investment in bringing Just Say Hi to your school. Uh, disabled kids deserve a curriculum that makes them feel seen. And they deserve a curriculum that works to help ensure 
their full community or their full inclusion in their school community. So you can spread the word about the Just Say Hi program amongst your peers. You can advocate for bringing it to your school. You can reach out to your school counselor, your assistant principal, your principal. You can engage your PTA leaders. You can advocate for a webinar similar to this to come to your school and you can continue to advocate for disability inclusion in the best interest of your whole community. And we can be a resource for these resources as well. So we thank y'all so much for your time here this evening. We've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, we'll leave our contact slide up here for a bit while we transition into the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Ashley and Rachel, for that presentation. Um, what a great way to kick off the series. Um, folks, now is your opportunity to type into the chat any questions that you might have um, about the presentation for CPF. And I'm happy to, to, to pose those questions to, to folks. There's a couple in here that, I, that, um, that, I, that I'll start, off, start us off with. But please, please uh, add your questions to the mix. Um, so the first question uh, is about the Just Say Hi program. And um, the, this person's asking, is it specific to a specific grade or is it for all grades? No, so the Just Say Hi program is actually from pre-K all the way up to grade 12. And not only is it for all grades, it's actually for all different subjects at school. So it can be implemented, for example, in English, it can be implemented in social studies, it could be PE, music, art. Um, you know, we really have um, made sure that wherever it's needed in school, it can be utilised. And I think, you know, the, the other wonderful piece is we've made it easy for people as well. So there's over 100 lesson plans. So literally you can say, all right, I need a lesson plan for grade three maths and we've got it. So I, I think it's, um, you know, a wonderful opportunity to implement it. The other thing that it also does is ideally it's in schools and it follows the student from grade to grade. So it actually builds upon each other. So, you know, our, our goal and our hope is that you would start it in kindergarten and you would, you know, follow it all the way through to grade 12 and really be able to develop all these other different components of understanding when it comes to the disability community. So Rachel, you just mentioned that it ideally would follow them from grade to grade. Can you talk a little bit about how it follows students home? Sure. So, you know, as we know, school communities are not just what's happening in the classroom and not just what's happening in the school. You know, the home environment is so important. And so when we sort of thinking about how it follows students home, depending on which lessons and how the school's actually implementing it, it can be in things like after school programs, it can also be implemented actually outside in sports clubs and components like that. And then obviously as parents, you know, we always make sure that whatever's getting taught in the classroom, there's a comprehensive then package that's getting uh, sent home because we know, like I didn't get taught disability history at school. So they're things that I'm, you know, was not aware of before I even started this program. So we make sure that obviously we equip parents with the same knowledge as well. Here's an interesting question. So what do you recommend or are there any steps that you recommend uh, for me to share with my, my child's school for them to take inclusion more seriously? Hmm. I think there's a couple of different things to think about and I'll let Ashley sort of chime in here as well. But I think when we want to say, all right, take inclusion seriously, the wonderful thing is there is research to show inclusion works. There's also research that shows just how much of a benefit is not just to the student with a disability, but to all students within the school, you know, and I think the, that is sort of the, a really strong message that we take home with uh, just say hi, is that we're not focusing just on students with disabilities. This is a whole school community and we have a responsibility as a school community. Um, but I think that whole piece to say that, you know, inclusion isn't, doesn't then exclude others. And I, I think that's sort of part of the, a little bit of a, um, misnomer that a lot of people think is okay well if we're doing inclusion that means other kids are missing out you know where we're prioritizing students with disabilities that need things and, and that's just not the case when it's done properly and when it's implemented in the right ways it really benefits the whole school community absolutely um so one of the questions in here is about 
Um, does the program address parents that are not accepting of their child to having a disability? Or, and, and I'm gonna reframe it a little bit and also say, it, are there resources as part of the curriculum or maybe separately that CPF has for families to talk to their kids about disability or to be introduced to the world of disability? Yeah, as part of the, the curriculum, obviously we have a robust resource list and that includes everything from, okay, how do you start introducing the concepts around disability and even language around disability to a child that's in pre-K. And, you know, the way that we believe the strongest way to do that is through representation. So thinking about, all right, in those books, making sure that there is disability representation, whether it be because the author has a disability, whether it be that the characters in the books have disabilities, but that's really important to us. So I think a really good place to start is obviously realizing that this is a big community and there's wonderful people as part of this community and there's so much success and so many, you know, incredible things that happen day to day. And so that's sort of part of what we do is we've put together this incredible resource that now has over a thousand uh, books, videos, films, whatever your favorite thing is. Um, it's in there, which is really helpful, obviously, in discussing disability and, you know, putting it out there. But representation to us is one of the most important pieces. And so that is sort of uh, you will meet. You met some people today as part of this webinar, but as part of the curriculum, you know, we really introduce, you know, disability as people. You know, it's, it's not just words. It's not just definitions. It's really people. Rachel, do you, have you... I mean, I, and I'm not gonna say have you because I know you have. Um, what is your impression of, of schools after they've done a year of just say hi? I think there's there's a lot of principals or schools who might say like, I may not be so comfortable implementing this curriculum in my school because it's not something that, I, that I'm really close to the, to, the, to the source material, but have you seen schools grow? And, and tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Yeah, so we've, as I said, we've been fortunate enough to be, uh, I've implemented this in quite a few schools across New York City. And, and one of the most amazing things that I've seen is, you know, we spoke about IEPs today and IEPs can have a bit of stigma and bias associated with them to, to one of those things that if a student has an IEP, it's something that they're not necessarily comfortable sharing or it's something that they could be embarrassed about, right? Now, at one of these schools, um, a student came up and they shifted the whole language and she was like, no, an IEP is something to be proud of. It means that I'm getting the help that I need. It means that I'm, you know, I'm getting seen for who I am as an individual and that, you know, I, I am growing and that my peers understand that I need help doing these certain things or I need these modifications and accommodations. So they'd really shifted this whole language. And this was from a student. This wasn't from a teacher. This was really from a student, you know, being proud of their identity. And before that, they would never have even, you know, wanted to tell their, their classmates they had an IEP. It was something that they were like, oh, I, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't want to tell people that I need help or, or I need these modifications and accommodations. So that was sort of one, you know, really wonderful thing that I saw. But really what you see in schools, I think is absolutely that hesitation to begin with going, oh gosh, this is either a daunting task or, you know, we maybe we think we already do inclusion well, we don't need this. But I think really what we saw was because it is such a structured program, as I said, it, it gives the professional development to teachers so they can get really comfortable with the content. And then it gives them the lesson plans and the structure of what they then do in the classroom. It gives that sort of almost, um, it's not a recipe, but it, it's pretty foolproof. Like you can actually go in and implement it quite easily. So schools absolutely love it. And um, they definitely saw a huge shift um, in, in their, their students thinking, their community thinking, you know, really, as a whole. And I know, you know, Ashley, I don't know whether you want to talk about just how much we hear from the disability community, how much they wished they had something like this when they were at school. Oh my goodness, all the time. It's a, it's a constant uh, refrain that, that almost all of us, we wish that we had a specific inclusion-based program focused on disability. I think a lot of us, you know, unfortunately experienced exclusion and bullying and really like unfortunate aspects of the school environment and that could have all been mitigated had inclusion you know been a thing 20 years ago so it's I think it's just crucially important for just starting the process of 
learning about disability early. You know, a lot of folks as adults, they're doing a lot of unlearning about disability. They're, they're reframing what they thought they knew and what they thought they were taught. And mostly because a lot of that teaching was done by non-disabled people. And now disabled people are kind of taking control of that narrative and driving the education. And so everybody's learning all new things, right? Through accurate representation. But how cool would it be if we're starting early, that, that that doesn't have to happen when today's kids become adults, right? Because they, they've already learned it all. They already know it. So I think that's kind of the true value of, of that. Oh my goodness. Well, listen, we could stay here all night and talk. Um, I just wanna say thank you again. What a great way to start the series. Uh, I'm just, I'm so excited that CPF has partnered with us to bring these sessions to our families. Uh, I've been working with you all for years to get Just Say Hi into DOE schools and to promote more inclusive communities. I mean, so much so that I, I still have my original Just Say I Hi. I love it. But so original that it still says social studies curriculum. Oh my gosh, there you go. That was, um, that was version, I don't even say want to say 1.0. That was like version pre 1.0. Yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I still reference it. Um, so our family is tuning in. Many of your children may have already participated in Just Say Hi at their schools and you might not have known. And I highly recommend that you connect with your child's schools to see if they have participated in Just Say Hi. And if not, maybe suggest that they reach out to CPF and look into it. Um, I will say that um, when, uh, for, when I'm particularly proud of how CPF has grown the curriculum year over year. And really in particular, the, this, this, this latest version has families with a prominent, uh, as a prominent stakeholder as part of the community curriculum. And they have a family engagement component. So I just, I just wanna shout that out. Um, and, it, and it really is about bringing the conversation, not just in the classroom, but to home as well. Um, so thank you to, to everyone here. And um, I have to give another shout out to Ms. Greeny Dixon who yeah has been rocking it with the with the ASL interpretation mm -hmm. and, and give her the thanks in advance for joining us for all of these sessions with CPF to interpret. Um, any, any closing thoughts from CPF folks? Debbie, I know you've been in the background very quiet, but I just also wanna shout you out and say thank you for the partnership. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Debbie is um, the lead of our inclusion and education programs. And so please, you know, her email um, was on the previous slide. So please reach out and we would love to get this in um, your children's schools. And we're just really excited. So this is part one, right? So we just dipped our toes in tonight and we can't wait for um, the rest of the series of these webinars and to really think about and to dive deeper into some of these um, other issues and themes that we, we see in schools. All right, well, thank you again for joining and thank you for the upcoming sessions. For those of you who are joining, we've been recording. We'll share the recording with you all tomorrow. Um, spread the word, make sure that everyone you think should be a part of this, uh, and honestly, everyone should be a part of this. Um, invite them every Tuesday night from seven to eight, we'll be here. Uh, but until then, stay safe everyone and we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.